Welcome to Leadership Reimagined, where game-changing conversations are reshaping the world of work. I'm Janice Ellig, CEO and founder of Ellig Group, executive search advisors, pioneers in redefining executive search through our unwavering commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Today on Leadership Reimagined, our topic is where brand meets value, a transformational shopping experience. And I am delighted to welcome Stephen Yaloff, president and CEO of Tanger. Tanger, a real estate investment trust, is a leading owner and operator of outlet and open-air retail shopping destinations. With over 43 years of expertise in the retail and outlet shopping industries, Tanger's portfolio includes 38 outlet centers, one adjacent managed center, and one open-air lifestyle center. Its portfolio across the U.S. and Canada comprises over 3,000 stores operated by more than 700 different brand name companies. Stephen has over 25 years of experience in the commercial real estate industry. And before joining Tanger, he spent six years as the chief executive officer of Simon Premium Outlets, where he drove forward the expansion and development of its real estate portfolio. Stephen previously served as Senior Vice President of Real Estate for Ralph Lauren and Senior Director of Real Estate for The Gap. Stephen serves as a trustee of the International Council of Shopping Centers, as well as the advisory boards of Headcount and the Center for Real Estate and Urban Analysis at George Washington University, his alma mater. After joining Tanger in 2020 as President and Chief Operating Officer, Stephen was named CEO the following year, succeeding Stephen B. Tanger, the son of Stanley Tanger, who founded the company in 1981. The company was also listed on the NYSE in 1993. Under Stephen's leadership, Tanger has truly continued to grow, thrive, and change. The company has increased same-center occupancy year over year, achieved 10 consecutive quarters of positive rent spreads, and repeatedly increased dividends, including a recent 6% increase. In the past year, the company has brought on new centers in Nashville, Tennessee, Asheville, North Carolina, and Huntsville, Alabama. Stephen, welcome. I'm so delighted you can join us today with all the activity that's going on at Tanger. Well, thank you for having me. And I'm a black belt shopper, as my husband would say. So I'm really anxious to get down to some of your new outlets like at Nashville and Asheville. But first, I wanted to start with your background. Who influenced you? What took you on this path to be CEO of commercial real estate consumer shopping business? Janice, it's been quite a journey. You know, I I have to go back to my, my teens, I, I, I grew up about a quarter of a mile from the Livingston Mall. And, you know, I found myself spending a lot of time walking the halls of the mall, shopping a lot of the stores, lots of window shopping, visiting the restaurants. It was always so exciting to me to see different brands coming in and out of that shopping center. It was just, it was always quite intriguing that when I was in college, I wrote my research paper on the Rouse Company. And my first job right out of college was uh, leasing real estate working for a company called uh, New Plan Realty Trust. New Plan had recently acquired a number of shopping centers that were outlet centers. This was late 80s, early 90s, and it was a brand new business. The Tangers had come out of the ground in 1981 when they founded their company, but outlet shopping was really a, a new sort of type of product that was being introduced to the marketplace. And I was a very early leasing person working for a collection of five or six centers that New Plan owned at the time. And so those were early days, early days in the business. And you saw the trend though. I mean, you saw what could be during those days. Yeah, sure. What was interesting to me, it was factory direct to the consumer. You know, back in the you know early 90s when outlets first started, it was very few vertical retailers like we see in outlet centers today. It was primarily outlet stores existed to support department store corners that major manufacturing brands had. Brands like Ralph Lauren, Mm -hmm. Calvin Klein, Tommy Hilfiger, you know, brands that are still very prominent in the business today. And then I can probably list 30 or 40 brands that no longer exist, but were mainstays in the early days of outlet. 
So this is really a competitive industry. It's changing, as you've described over the years. And so what we're talking about today is really brand meeting value. And you're, you've said in many interviews that that's what the customer wants. So describe some of these initiatives that you have underway to really give Tango that competitive advantage and the changes that you've made to this organization since you've been uh, leading it. The outlet centers of Let's go back to the early 90s. The one rule was they had to be 100 miles or so away from any major department store competition because the department stores had so much clout back then that they were able to dictate where that off-price competition could come from. We, on the retailer side, we called it wholesale sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, a lot of those same paradigms exist today, particularly the one where brands use a lot of their marketing capital to tell the consumer about the newest, the latest, and more importantly, the full price product that they have in their offering. But outlets, when outlets are advertised, or at least when they were advertised in the past, it was 90 famous name brands on mm-hmm. sale every day. You never really knew what brands you were going to get when you got there, but you knew that it was going to be famous brand names and you knew that every day at everyday value pricing. That paradigm has shifted and that's part of that change that we at Tanger are leading. So what are those initiatives that you have underway uh, at this time, Stephen? Well, we, you know, there's been a big rise in the number of vertical retailers that have gotten into the outlet business. And again, going back to the narrative of branded value. So brands like The Gap and all of their brand extensions, Ann Taylor and Loft and all of their brand extensions, Lululemon today, Viore, you know, brands are finding the vertical retailers that aren't necessarily selling into the department stores as they did in the past are finding they too need a place to clear excess inventory within the four walls of an environment that a customer is going to specifically to find value. So in the past, when I was at The Gap in the late 90s, as a real estate person there, our strategy was very simple. For every 10 Gap stores, find a consolidation store so that we could take the products that aren't selling at full price, pull them out of that stores inventory so that they could maintain higher margins in the more expensive real estate and consolidate a lot of that product into their different parts of that retail infrastructure within their full price arena that they would call consolidation stores. And outlet led to moving a lot of that consolidation product into outlet environment. Hence, we saw that huge rise in vertical retailers coming into the business. And we continue to feed that narrative today. You know, those brands I mentioned, the athletic brands, Lululemon, Viore, Athleta, that are now very prominent in the business are selling excess inventory pulled from their infrastructure and their network of full price stores in these environments where the customer is going specifically to find the brands they love at the best possible value. So how do you pick these locations? So you went to Nashville, right? And Asheville um, and Huntsville. How do you pick these locations and, and where else do you plan to expand? Just to be clear on those three particular locations, Mm -hmm. um, Nashville was a ground up development for us. So that was a location that we decided would be great for our brand of shopping outlet. But because of the amazing growth spurt that Nashville has enjoyed over the past four or five years, our vision for the center evolved even during the construction and planning phase. So that center was initially targeted to be 100% outlet, but because of the local growth and the community, the development that's taken place in that community, we decided that our shopper was looking for more things than just that value shopping experience. They were looking for more of an entertainment and around it experience. A lot of that goes back to the timing too, because Nashville came out of the ground immediately following COVID. COVID, I believe, has completely changed 
the way the consumer shops bricks and mortar today. So explain that a little bit more because many other malls and stores have closed, right? Because shoppers went online, but you are thriving. I think because first of all, let's start with the fact that we are predominantly open air shopping centers. Mm -hmm. So if you just, the, the early days coming out of COVID where all of the public venues were closed from sports arenas to movie theaters to Broadway, places where to indoor dining, places where people traditionally gathered, unfortunately, the public no longer had access. But what they did have access to right. was open air shopping centers. Mm -hmm. And our centers opened up far more quickly than any of those other venues that I just named. Because of that, we quickly pivoted to the understanding that the shopper is probably, if we're going to get that customer to come and gather with us, we got to, we, we need to provide them with far more than just a value shopping experience. They're going to be looking for places to dine. Now, the outlet center is going back to my early days. Those power shopping experiences, which was brand, 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 you know, grab and go food brand, 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 same kind of thing. We needed to augment that experience by providing better amenities to the customer, better food and beverage to the customer, and more important, more types of uses that will get them off the couch and out of their home and into our venues. You have spoken a lot about that in terms of the need to drive what you call newness into your properties and really bringing that community together. So, and you know, your stock's up 30% from 2023. You have over 120 million loyal customers annually and growing. So you're doing a lot of things right to bring that consumer, you know, post COVID into sort of a, almost a community experience, which includes shopping and dining. What else is on the docket in terms of what you want to do for newness in your outlets? You know, the, the concept of newness, and I'm glad you brought that up because you asked the question earlier about those who had influenced me early in my career. You know, when I was at The Gap, uh, Mickey Drexler was the president of the company at the time. And whenever he sat in front of the real estate team and we had the opportunity to listen to him speak, he would talk about his vision for Gap stores. And, you know, I was there in the late 90s. And as you know, that was probably one of Gap's greatest growth spurts. And that was a time where Gap was peak of success. I'm very complimentary of Gap today. I think what they're what they're doing and reinventing themselves is pretty amazing. But But at that point in the 90s, one of the things that was so important to Mickey was constantly evolving the product in the store and creating newness in the store so the shopper would continue to come back and that the product didn't get stale. You know, I take that concept and apply it to what we're doing too. The customer is constantly evolving. The loyal brand fans of years ago, well, there's so many new brands being put in front of consumers today, whether they're you know, seeing them on athletes or other influencers or on the internet or through TikTok or, or Instagram. There's so many ways to get new brands and new products in front of consumers. That loyalty that a lot of brands enjoyed in the 80s, the 90s, and even the early 2000s is far more difficult to compete for. Well, for us, we see that from the, the developer's point of view as how do we get those brands in front of the consumer at a similar pace. And we do so using a number of different strategies. And one of which is the pop-up store. 10 years ago, nobody even knew what a pop-up store was, but today it's- I love them. It's yeah, I love them. Right, exactly. It's part of everybody's language. Yeah. So essentially what we're saying to brands, and you know, getting into outlet is slightly different for a lot of brands because you don't know how much excess inventory you have. So to make a commitment to a 10 year lease for a storefront is pretty difficult for many, many brands who probably need to try the outlet concept before they are comfortable signing their name to a long-term deal. So, you know, we're very entrepreneurial at Tanger. We want to work with as many brands as possible. And, you know, we're we're excited for the successes because then I can rattle off five or six of them from brands like Serena and Lily, Tory Birch, Vineyard Vines, Ugg, Hook. These were brands that popped up in most of our shopping centers before they signed long-term leases just to get an understanding of whether or not 
they had long-term viability and continue to be successful. I think from an entrepreneurial point of view, that's a, a wonderful way to do business with these brands because you build trust. If they're successful, they're looking to grow and be more successful with you. And if they're not successful, we allow them to fail fast and leave because again, we don't want to be part of that. You know, we, we're, we're happy to be part of an experimental lab for a lot of these brands, but if it doesn't work, then let's fill that space with something that does work. So to us, that's a huge part of that newness that's so vital in our centers that we think draw that customer, going back to Mickey's old narrative of uh, constantly bringing the customer back. We think that newness does a really good job of bringing in a new customer, but also brings customers back that are constantly seeking new brands. Yes. And you're a Nashville outlet. You, I understand 20% of the stores are new brands. So you allow these new brands to come in and if they can be successful, then to be with you for the longer term. But if not, they can come get out of that lease is, or how, how does that work? Well, in, in the case of a pop-up, they can for sure. You know, in the case of a long-term lease, that's a different story. But again, you know, when you have a successful project like Nashville that's 100% occupied, if a retailer was struggling and wanted a conversation, we're always willing to have. You know, we've got a whole team of folks internally that work here that work with retailers to try to help them become more successful in their in their stores. You know, the retailers know how to sell their product. They know who their customer is. They know the demographics that work best for them. But our shopping team is very local to the marketplace where our centers exist. And there are certain nuances to that local catchment that may elude uh, some of the brands we find it very helpful when our marketing team works with brands and helps them better navigate and understand that local consumer, which typically leads to a more successful experience for the retail. Sounds like a great partnership. One succeeds, the other succeeds as well. So let's talk a little bit about the Tanger Club app, which makes it possible for shoppers to easily find and use digital offers and really tailored to their interests. How does that work and how are you using your digital channels? Again, a lot of people want to go online to shop, but are you bringing them in online or are you bringing them into the store? How does that work? Well, it's a combination of both. So we we know that people use their phones to do the window shopping. You know, in fact, I would I would submit that the even the best malls across the country and around the world have lost a shopper visit, that window shopping visit, because people can do their window shopping online. So rather than put our head in the sand and pretend that that phenomenon doesn't exist, we think it's very important that we embrace these digital initiatives and give the give our consumer the opportunity to see product that they're going to ultimately find in the shopping center so they they can have a better experience planning their trip. You know, so I think that our digital initiatives are part of that solution as opposed to, you know, exacerbating a much bigger problem. You know, customers want to shop, particularly for 50% of the products in our shopping centers are apparel and footwear. That product is critical for people to touch, to try on, to feel. But if you're in the market for you know, a pair of black loafers, then that window shopping experience could perhaps help you limit your, you know, the, the, the store, the stores that you're going to visit to two from 10 so that you can save time. We certainly still value the consumer's time. And so we want to make sure that that shopping visit is as seamless as possible. So in this particular anecdote that I'm sharing, the consumer can see what stores carries the product they want. They can, in some instances, have a make a connection to the retailer themselves and reserve product for buy online, pick up in store, or they can just go ahead and have a little bit more of a targeted experience when they get to the shopping center. Makes me want to go out and start shopping right now. <laughs> <laughs> So let's talk about the Tanger employees, because I understand women lead over 50% of your centers, and Tanger has several all-female center management teams, and you've helped advance not just women, but LGBT, Q community, people of color across the workforce. Is that you're representing your clients you're serving to have this great diversity? Uh, wh what is it like to work and be a Tanger employee? Let's start by saying one of the governing principles here is we want to look more like our our customers every day. You know, it's interesting. I say to the team when we do our quarterly town halls, right. I usually start by reminding everybody that not only are they a Tanger employee, but they're also a Tanger shopper because every single person that works for our company shops in our shopping centers. And, you know, as a company, we know what we do right. You know, 
what we don't know is what we're not doing right. Because if we knew, we wouldn't do it. All right. <laughs> so I'm constantly challenging the team to get out, speak to customers, and be customers and provide us with their feedback. And the emails that I get, like the great mentors that I've had, one of the things that I've learned, the best people that I've had the opportunity to work with is you read every email and you return every email. And you do so, if you can do so in a sort of a, a head spinning speed, you're gonna build a fan for life. And whether that's somebody who works for you or somebody who shops with you, you owe them that respect if they're gonna take a minute to send you something to get back to them. I just, you know, nobody ever said that to me out loud, but it's the experience of getting that bounced back returned email that quickly has always really moved me. And I've always said to myself, that's something that I want to try to try to emulate. That's a best practice. Yesterday, I, I received customer feedback from somebody on our loyalty program. They had a difficulty navigating. My first instinct to that consumer was, how did we miss that? You know, so I responded back and said, you know, you're right. That's a flaw. Thank you for pointing that out. That's something that we are going to jump on immediately, which we did. And it's only going to, that feedback is going to make us better. If you multiply that by the 450 people that work for Tanger every day, it's the responsibility of our senior leadership team to make sure that we're listening to our people and listen, listening to the people that work for the company and the people that are on the ground talking to the consumer every day. How does that spill back into looking more like our consumer? The diversity of consumers that shop in our shopping centers, we need to have an equally diverse population of people working for this company so that we can interpret those messages the proper way so that there's no bias, there's a clean line of communication, we understand what they're talking about, and we are in touch when so many brands and so many businesses are out of touch. We want to be in touch. We want to know what our customers are doing. We want to understand what's going on in communities. We want to be a part of that community and we, in an authentic way so that we become part of the fabric of the consumer and part of the fabric of the folks that are working in the shopping center that are so vital to the lifeblood and the success of any of our shopping centers. I think if more companies had that mantra, that value, customers would be much happier. It really is troublesome when you don't get a response back from any organization when you're having an issue. The fact that you have embedded this in the way the company operates, the way you operate as a value, and you're saying community first and to be part of the community speaks volumes about the culture at Tanger. So congratulations, Stephen, because I don't see that Everybody is doing that today and maybe the speed at which things have to get done. But if you, you know, you take the time to do it and that's what, what you're doing. So your leadership obviously is a pretty strong, well-versed in the area. You've been in it all your whole life. What people who are listening and want to be CEOs, want to be leaders in your field and what you've done, what does it take to be a leader leading the largest REIT consumer outdoor outlets. What does it take today? You have to love the work. You can fall in love with the title and you can fall in love with the perks and you can fall in love with all the things that come with that, you know, the, the letters after your sort of your name. But if you don't love the work, what's driving you to innovate? What's driving you to, to create? What's driving you to go after, you know, sort of the, the next great thing? And that's just, it's the love of the work. I said two things my, my whole career, that I never went to work for companies, I always went to work for people. I fortunately found myself in wonderful companies and maybe because they just had such wonderful people leading them. You know, from you know, Arnold Laubisch at New Plan Realty Trust to Mickey at The Gap and Roger Farah at Ralph Lauren and Bridget Ryan Berman, who hired me at Ralph Lauren. I mean, it's just the people that I've been able to learn from along the journey, I think shared a similar ethos, that they were there because they loved what they were doing. And you know, if you love what you're doing and you just execute at the highest level, all those other things just take care of themselves. But to run the size of an organization that you run with outlets and more to be popping up for people who may want to get into this field down the road. What do they need to, is it the creativity? Is it the thinking always the newness? Is it thinking the community? What are some of those 
attributes and or skill sets that you think are necessary for somebody to succeed in this field? Well, the first thing I would say is the people. You have to think about the people. You have to think about your team. You have to think about the people that you surround yourselves with. I mean, you can be the greatest visionary in the world, but if you can't execute, who cares? You know, so you need to, you need a team of people that you trust that you know can execute at that same level. You want to hire into your blind spots. And what that means to me is, you know, I know what I do well. I also know what I don't do so well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm very fortunate to have a chief operating officer in Leslie Swanson, who, you know, we say we're the eyes in back of each other's heads <laughs> because, you know, what I see so clearly <laughs> is she see the things that I don't see as clearly are the things that she sees so clearly. And when you can have a partner like Leslie, who sees this business from her perspective and her experience. I call her the culture creator because she has had this following since the first day I met her 10 years ago of uh, people who just, she, she grew up in the business. She is the gold standard for our achievement, success, and mobility throughout an organization. And you know, as lucky as I am to have her as my partner here, I think the field team feels equally lucky to have her as their leader. That's wonderful because she leverages you, you leverage her, and everybody everybody really wins. You know, you've talked so much about the culture, which sounds truly appealing and a magnet for great talent. You're also supporting a number of not-for-profits and community organizations through your Tanger Care programs. Can you talk about what some of those awards are that you give and the funding that you do of schools? through the Tanger Kids program. Yeah, you know, the Tanger Kids grant program is something that was founded in the very early days of this company and something that we considered incredibly important to continue to this day without a material change to how we to how we execute. So it really was an example of a wonderful program whose legacy has remained intact. And essentially with the, the 40 or so geographies that we currently serve, we recognize that there are schools and school programs that desperately need funding. So through Tanger Kids, we put out RFPs for grants to a lot of those communities. And based on their presentations, we're able to award uh, a significant amount of money every year across those communities. You know, it's a program that I was uh, actually able last year, I, I went to Mebbin and actually gave the check to the school in, in Mebbin next, right next to one of our shopping centers. I just think it's really important. You know, it's very easy to say we're Tanger so important to the communities, but, you know, talking about it and doing something about it are completely different things. We're, we're a company of action. We're one that likes to do things more than we, we like to talk about those things that we're doing. So I'm thankful that you brought that up because I don't think it's a program that that many people know about, but it's certainly one that's, that's important to the schools, the communities, and the individuals that it serves. You know, it's so important because so many people in these communities don't have the wherewithal, you know, and you're, you're really helping to support that. Any parting words for our audience about, you know, Tanger, the employees, your communities? What can we expect next? Well, our vision statement at Tanger is that we use customer insights and information to inform the future of shopping. And it sounds technical because it's supposed to look pretty good on on paper. (laughs) But what that really means is we're a company of people that are out there listening to the consumer Mm -hmm. and observing and being consumers ourselves and thinking, I went and shopped at Tanger Center today and I had a really good experience, but it could have been great if, you know, and fill in the blank. And I encourage our team to fill in the blank. And when I walk around shopping centers and I talk to consumers and I do this all the time, I ask them to fill in the blank because what are they looking for? What else do they need? You know, we, I, had a shop, I had a shopper say to me a couple of years ago, we've got great brands, great apparel, great footwear. This would be great if this could be a one-stop shop for me and I didn't have to park my car anywhere else in town and I can get my food shopping done. Or I can get, I can go to a cosmetic store. So we've now opened up the aperture and are bringing in brands into Tanger that may not be outlet stores, 
that may be unconventional in a typical Tanger footprint, but we're listening to the consumer and we're recognizing how important it is to them that they have more things to do when they come and shop with us. So the Tanger Center of today looks dramatically different than the Tanger Center of just a few years ago, adding brands like Sephora and Ulta Beauty and sit down restaurants like Shake Shack and Prince's Hot Chicken and amenities like Dave and Buster's and X Golf Golf Simulators and groceries and markets like Russo's in Grand Rapids and Nantucket Meat and Fish in Hilton Head, South Carolina. So we're listening to our customers. We're bringing them what we want. We know it's an incredible battle to get the customer off the couch and anywhere. So even as difficult to get them into a shopping center. So we're trying to make that decision and that journey far more simpler by providing them very simply with the things they're asking us for. Stephen Yeloff, President and CEO of Tanger, are you are redefining leadership because the voice of the customer really matters to you and to your people. And what you're doing is really impressive because you're improving society overall by people having a great experience in their community through this shopping experience where you're really trying to meet a lot of their needs in your outlets. So thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your story, the culture of Tanger. And I am going to be going down to Asheville soon. <laughs> and I will, I, will, I will be sure to write you a letter. I don't know if I'm going to have any suggestions, but I'm really looking forward to it and Nashville as well and, and locally here on the island. So thank you so much for joining us today. It's an incredible story, incredible leadership. And it's great to know that the customer voice really is being heard by you all. Thank you so much for having me. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in to another game-changing conversation on Leadership Reimagined. You can find me on LinkedIn, Instagram, or visit our website at ellagroup.com. Thank you so much for joining us today.